Before we move on to the identification of LAD and RAD on the ECG, it is important to realize that although the cardiac axis lies close to lead two in many cases, its position demonstrates a wide normal variation. We will discuss the reasons for this later. For now, note that the normal range for the cardiac axis is taken to lie between plus 90 degrees, or straight down AVF, and minus 30 degrees, straight along AVL. Outside this normal range, if the axis lies beyond AVL, this is termed left axis deviation. If the axis lies beyond AVF, this is termed right axis deviation. Axis deviation into the fourth quadrant, or no man's land, as it is sometimes referred to, is observed in certain situations, but we will leave discussion of this to the quiz section. So, to deal with LAD first, how do we recognize left axis deviation? That is deviation of the cardiac axis beyond minus 30 degrees. Well, if we start by considering an axis of plus 60 degrees, you will remember that this situation is characterized by strongly positive QRS complexes in leads one, two, and three. As the axis moves towards the left, towards and then beyond 90 degrees off lead three, this lead will begin to develop an S wave. As the axis continues to move further towards the left, but still within the normal range, even lead two will eventually start to develop a significant S wave. And the S wave in lead three will become progressively deeper. In contrast, as the axis is moving closer to the direction of lead one, this lead retains a strong R wave. Crucially, note that at the limit of normality on the left, the axis is traveling straight down AVL. AVL lies at 90 degrees relative to lead two. This means that when the axis lies at the limit of normality on the left, lead two is isoelectric. The R wave and S wave in this lead are equal in magnitude. Once the axis moves beyond AVL into abnormal territory, the QRS complex in lead two becomes overall negative with an S wave larger than the R wave. This pattern of a strongly negative QRS complex in lead three combined with an overall negative QRS in lead two and a positive lead one is instantly recognizable as left axis deviation. The commonest cause of this abnormal ECG finding is left anterior fascicular block. In physical terms, the deep terminal S waves observed in this situation in the inferior leads result from the retrograde depolarization of the lateral and anterior left ventricular wall. This depolarizing force is slightly delayed relative to normal and spreads upwards from the anastomoses in the lateral wall. As it is moving away from leads two and three, a negative deflection is produced in these leads. You can work out the ECG appearance of right axis deviation in exactly the same way as we did for LAD. Remember lead one and lead AVF are separated by 90 degrees. When the axis moves beyond AVF, into right axis deviation territory, the QRS complex in lead one becomes overall negative, while that in lead three remains positive. Left posterior fascicular block is less common than damage to the anterior fascicle. However, when this situation does arise, it results in right axis deviation on the ECG. The late deep S wave in lead one reflects the delayed retrograde spread of depolarization away from this lead in the inferior wall. 
As this depolarizing voltage is moving towards lead three, this lead retains a strong R wave. You may have noticed that although still within the normal range, the QRS complexes in both LAD and RAD are somewhat widened compared to our starting readouts with the axis at 60 degrees. Keep in mind that damage to the distal branches of the left bundle branch, the commonest cause of axis deviation, results in a slight delay in depolarization of the affected region of myocardium. For this reason, in axis deviation, the QRS duration tends to be in the upper limit of the normal range, between 0 0.1 and 0 0.12 seconds. And positive and negative components of the QRS complex in the individual leads separate to some degree. It is well worth being familiar with the QRS patterns of left and right axis deviation in the standard limb leads. You may simply memorize these patterns. Alternatively, as outlined in video two of this section, you can analyze the morphology of the frontal leads and determine the axis from first principles.